Good morning, members, members of the public. As clerk of the Legislative Assembly, it is my duty to call the second meeting of the Territorial Leadership Committee to order and to preside over the selection of a speaker-elect. I would like you to rise and I would ask Mr. Norn to please lead us in prayer. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. O Creator, may your spirits and guidance be in us as we work for the benefit of all our people, for peace and justice in our land, and for the constant recognition of the dignity and aspirations of, whom, of those whom we serve. Merci, Joe. Members, before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize a few former members that are uh, watching our proceedings from the gallery today. I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Tom Bolio, former member, former minister, Mr. Bill Braden, a former member of the Legislative Assembly, and Mr. Herb Nakamayak, a former member of the Legislative Assembly. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you in our proceedings. All members have a copy of the agenda in front of them. The next item on the agenda is the review and adoption of the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions from the floor? Seeing none, is the agenda adopted? Agreed. Or agreed? Thank you, members. This is the second meeting of the Territorial Leadership Com Committee for members of the 19th Legislative Assembly. In front of you, in addition to your agenda, are the guidelines and procedures for the selection of your speaker, Premier and members of the Executive Council, and these have been previously agreed upon and publicized. The process for the election of the Speaker will begin with self-nominations from the floor. In accordance with your agreed upon procedures, I will ask members to indicate whether they wish to allow their names to stand for the Speaker's position. Once members indicate their interest, each candidate will then be permitted to make a five-minute speech. The speeches will be made in alphabetical order by surname. Questions to the candidates will not be permitted, and voting will then commence by way of secret ballot. If only one nomination is received, that member uh, shall be acclaimed. Are all members of the committee in agreement with this process for the selection of speaker? Thank you, members. Once you have chosen your speaker-elect, that individual will assume the chair of the Territorial Leadership Committee and will preside over your proceedings for the balance of the day. With regard to some technical matters, members should be aware that you are not required to turn on your microphones. This will be done automatically for you. Also in front of members and built into your desks are the timing mechanisms. When speeches are being made, clocks will count down the time available to you and you are asked to please be mindful of the time limits that have been set and agreed to uh, amongst yourselves. I wish to make members aware that your proceedings today are being broadcast live on the Legislative Assembly television network as well as on social media. Our proceedings today are being simultaneously translated into the Klicho, Chippewan, South Slavey, North Slavey, Inuvialuktun, Inuktitut, French, and Gwich'in languages. I would also like to remind members that although this is a less formal committee than the House itself, members are please asked to stand while they speak. I understand that Mr. Alfred Moses is also in the gallery, former member, former minister. Welcome, Mr. Moses. The next item on the agenda is item five, election of speaker. You have the speaker selection guidelines in your packages. As per the guidelines, my first duty is to ask all members that wish to allow their names to stand for the position of speaker to rise in their place. Please do so now. As Mr. Frederick Blake is the only nominee for the position of Speaker, it is my duty to advise you that Mr. Blake has been acclaimed to the position of Speaker-elect. Congratulations. <laughs> this appointment will be confirmed by motion in the House tomorrow afternoon, but at this time I would like to ask Mr. Blake to please come forward and assume the Chair of the Territorial Leadership Committee. Is it 
can tell I'm a little eager today. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I would like to thank you all for the trust you have placed in me as your speaker-elect. I will have a lot, a lot more to say tomorrow when the 19th Assembly officially opens. The next item on the agenda is the election of Premier. Our agreed-upon procedures will see us call for members to ask one question to the previously nominated candidates. As we all know, the candidates for the Premier position are Carolyn Cochran, Jackson Lafferty, Frida Marcellos, and R.J. Simpson. Members are now permitted to ask a maximum of one question to be directed to all Premier candidates. Candidates will have two and a half minutes to answer each question. In the interest of time, I will be consistent in enforcing these timelines today. Members, the floor is now open for questions. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Canada has re-elected the Liberal Party to again lead our country. With the minority government in place, we may end up with another election fairly soon. It is therefore important for our government to quickly establish an immediate and effective working relationship with the federal government to address issues such as our fiscal position, state of our economy, health, housing, land claims, and many more that directly impact the residents of the NWT. The question I pose to the candidates is, if, e if elected Premier, what do you see as the first and most pressing issue respecting the NWT that you would raise with the Prime Minister of Canada, and why? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. The first candidate we have is Ms. Marcellos. Thank you, uh, Mr. S Mr. Chair. Um, the most important thing that we would have to uh, uh, express our interest in would be the economy. Uh, the economy of the Northwest Territories is uh, is at a crossroads, and I think that uh, the main uh, the main issue with the economy is extremely important. Uh, we know that we are in a, a deficit of over $1 billion and addressing the whole ideas and uh, uh, I think that something has to be put forward to make sure that we address the whole thing with the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Merci, um Mr. Mr. Speaker, congratulations. Um, part, part of the process should be that uh, whoever is elected as a premier and cabinet need to uh, uh, obviously meet with uh, the newly formed uh, Liberal government. Although they're a minority, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, moving targets uh, in uh, Ottawa. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, uh, I agree with the economy as well. Um, those, those are areas that we need to have an informed discussion with uh, the federal government. We need to continue to push our existing infrastructure that's before the, the federal government. And we push as a territorial government over the years. And we have uh, mega projects uh, that's, uh, that's on the books right now and are waiting to be approved. So we need to continue to push that forward because that will have a lasting positive impact in the Northwest Territories and at the same time, uh, building a relationship that we have with the uh, federal government. The new pri prime minister and uh, also the, the cabinet to be uh, whoever that will be, but at the same time, we must have a, a strong working relations with our MP and also our senator uh, for the Northwest Territories. We need to uh, utilize their services uh, because they are our gateways to Ottawa, uh, opening doors for us. So let's build a, we have positive working relations with our current MP and newly, uh, again, re-elected. And we need to build a foundation even more going forward because we do have a lot of challenges, but the, 
But at the same time, I'm, I'm optimistic. There's great opportunities for Northwest Territories. And this is time. It's time that we move forward with the federal government because um, we need to form uh, positive working relations with, with them as well. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next we have Ms. Calker. Thank you, Speaker-elect. Um, I agree with uh, the last two speakers that the economy in the Northwest Territories is a huge issue that we need to address. However, I must also state that we need to make sure that our priorities line up with the mandates of the Liberal government that is newly elected because it's strategic to make sure that we're asking for the same thing that can meet their goals. I think that as a, one of the beauties that we have is being a consensus government. So over the last four years as a minister, when I've met with uh, different federal ministers and in different jurisdictions, I have not made it an issue of putting my voice behind one party, and I think that's important. As a consensus government, we have to support all parties, especially in a minority government, um, and relationships are critical. So we have a very strong member of parliament. We need to use that. Um, Michael McLeod has been for us for the last four years. He's a strong advocate for the Northwest Territories. We need to strengthen that. We have a strong relationship. We need to use that relationship. So we need to meet with the, the Liberal Party. We need to make sure that our priorities can fit within their priorities, and we need to move forward, not in an aggressive way. Um, aggression is not the answer. I've learned that as I've aged in a collaborative way, working towards them, showing how if they, benef if they support our uh, jurisdiction, the Northwest Territories, that it will actually further their priorities as well. Working together is the key. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Next we have Mr. Simpson, Jr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. In 2015, when I was elected, I was asked the question, what was the first thing I was going to do when I uh, went to the, came to the Legislative Assembly here in Yellowknife? And my answer was, I was going to build relationships. And uh, when I was uh, acclaimed to this assembly, the first thing I wanted to do was build relationships. So I reached out to, to all the new members. And if elected Premier, the first thing I would do is build a relationship with uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, we, you know, we have priorities, but if we're not on their radar, if we don't have that kind of access at the very top, then our priorities aren't going to be heard. It, it's good to have relationships with, uh, you know, cabinet ministers and, and the bureaucracy as well, but to have uh, the year of the Prime Minister, I think, is very important because we have uh, serious issues facing us. And I'd let them know to expect a new way of doing business from the territory as well uh, that do line up with the Liberal priorities. The Liberals are, uh, they talk a lot about reconciliation. There's nowhere in the country that does reconciliation like the Northwest Territories, and going forward, uh, we're going to see a new way of it. We're going to uh, move forward arm in arm with Indigenous governments, uh, and we're going to go to Ottawa with our Indigenous partners to address some of these issues, to address these infrastructure issues, uh, so that we can be a sustainable economy on our own, so we don't have to wait, wait for our $1.3 billion welfare check from Ottawa every year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Nok Nokubli, sorry, <coughs> I mispronounced that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Nokubli. Um, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations uh, to Sunny. Um, so this kind of builds on uh, Rocky's question there, Mr. Simpson's question, sorry. Um, uh, if we want to advance all of these great big infrastructure projects that we've been discussing for several years now, if not decades, uh, one of the key issues for that, or the most important thing we're going to have to do is go to Ottawa and ask for a significant portion of the funding. And I'm, I'm aiming to look for more than the 75% actually that they usually pony up. So my question to the, uh, the premier candidates is, what experience and skill set do you bring to the table that will enable us to get that money from Ottawa and convince them that they do need to invest in the North and do better uh, in taking care of all of us and seeing that the Northern infrastructure projects are not just for the territory, but they're for the entire uh, nation and that they're uh, part of our Arctic sovereignty and our access to the Northern ports. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nautkabri. Um, first, we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the question and, and to continue on with what I was saying. We need to be on the, the federal government's radar. Politics is, is, a lot of politics is sales, and it's, it's relationship building. 
And I've been able to uh, do that over the last four years, I, I believe anyways. I had uh, you know, relatively good relationships across the board in the last assembly. I mean, there were always strained relationships between cabinet and the regular members, you know, but I prided myself on being able to, to work with people and to reach out and I think that, that's what I would bring. And it's not just reaching out to the federal government, it's reaching out to the indigenous governments. And it's understanding that, you know, if we want more from Ottawa, we have to uh, not, not we, don't, we can't keep everything for the GNWT. We have to understand that uh, our indigenous governments are our partners and moving forward, we have to include them uh, with uh, equity shares in these, in these projects. We have to make sure that we all benefit. And I think that's the kind of attitude that we need going forward because we're, we are stronger together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. I'd like to ask all members to please speak slowly to allow the interpreters to keep up. Thank you. <clears throat> Next we have Ms. Marcellus. Well, I have the experience of going to Ottawa. I have built those relationships. I have dealt with the uh, federal government, and, uh, and I'm very thankful that uh, uh, MP McLeod got, got in again. We have a very narrow window, like uh, one of my colleagues said, of two years. I think it's extremely important that we're well organized to ensure that uh, our issues are on the table with this new government. It's uh, going to be a narrow window because uh, uh, we have a minority government. Uh, you know, when we have, we have to make sure that uh, the Indigenous partners are also involved and all the partners, whether it be uh, private industry, but I think that uh, when we go, we go as a group, we go as partners, we go, we collaborate with all the people that is necessary and we be persistent. And I think that persistence is what gets you your, what you need in the end. You won't get everything, but you will mediate through to make sure that we get as much as we can. There are new ways of doing business with this whole file, with the infrastructure, and uh, I think that's what uh, the, the people of the Northwest Territories want. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Masiya, Speaker Elect. Do you also know the other federal government? We now have the Liberal Party as a government, so we depend on them to operate in the North. They asked what I was going to do, what, what kind of skills I have. I have a lot of experience. I was a minister for many years. I also had a good relationship with a federal minister for about eight years. So they also know what I can do. And also the indigenous leadership, if we get their support, It is uh, better to bring the issues to the government if we have the Denny leadership behind us as well. We cannot go to Ottawa as a one person, individual person. We need the support of all the other leadership and have one voice and it will go a long ways. We all know the federal ministers will be selected soon. When, and also, we have to think about the capital infrastructure in the Northwest Territories. We have to have that in place, and we also have settled claims in the Northwest Territories, but we also have two still outstanding uh, claims that needs to be settled. So we need that support. We need to support them as well. So if with all this leadership in the Northwest Territories will be able to bring our issues to the federal government. I think it will make a big difference. I think that's very important. Let's have a good relationship, a respectful relationship with them and things can be accomplished. I've been a minister for eight years so I had experience working with the federal ministers as well. So. 
I feel like I do have the experience to do this job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next we have Ms. Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Um, experience, what, do I, what am I bringing to the table? I have 20 years that I've been a social worker. I've got 20 years, over 20 years, that I've actually spent counseling people. So listening is one of the biggest skills that I have, being able to work with people, not cutting them off, I think is very important. I also spent the last four years building the relationships with the Liberal government, with all governments, not only the Liberal government. I stated before, and I'm adamant that it's important that we maintain relationships with all parties and all jurisdictions. Um, things can change in a moment. Um, I'm honest. Honesty is one of the most important traits. I see it as a strength and a weakness. Sometimes people say honesty is not good, but I believe if I am honest at all times, I don't have to lie to cover my lies, and that's important to me. The other thing that I bring that's really important is when I was younger, I've always been a strong woman. When I was younger and I first got into social worker, I was a strong advocate, yelling and screaming and holding up the picket signs. I've learned as I've aged that that is the wrong approach. That should be the last resort. So we do need to go into Ottawa with all of the Indigenous governments, if they're willing to come with us, the community governments. We need to come as a unit, but we also need to build the relationships one-on-one. -on -one. The last thing that I would want to see as a minister is a group of 20 people at my door. Automatically, my guards will go up. So it's important that we go, that the Premier go first and build a relationship Premier to the Prime Minister and build that first to make sure that they feel comfortable. Give them notice we're coming and make it a win-win situation, not a we're pushing our, our needs down your throat. But this is how our needs will benefit Canada as a whole. And so those are things that I bring to the table and those are the things that I've learned from my experience, my professional experience, and also my age. So thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Next, we have Mr. Simpson. He already went. Next question. Oh, already going ahead here. <laughs> Sorry. Any further questions? <clears throat> Mr. O'Reilly. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. Um, I'd like to know from each of the candidates what they believe the environmental priorities should be for the 19th Assembly and how those priorities would stack up against other priorities. I'll see Mr. Speaker. Just putting up their hands. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Now uh, we have Ms. Culkin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The environmental priorities that we have for, for the government of the Northwest Territory should not only be our priorities. They need to be international priorities. Climate change is real, and it's impacting our communities, impacting the Northwest Territories more than many other jurisdictions in the world. We see that. We've had members talk about it already in the short time we've been in the House. We've seen it in the last session. So during my speech as to be Premier, I had stated that anything that we do from moving forward has to have climate change always at being looking at that and, and uh, realizing that we do need infrastructure, we need a strong economy, but we also need to be as environmentally conscious as possible within that. We need to be part of the solution in battling climate change. Our youth are screaming at us. Our youth are begging us, crying in the media to save their future. We have an obligation to do that. So climate change, the realities, the, the environment has to always be hand in hand with any decision we make moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Next we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Obviously, climate change is a, is a global crisis and uh, everyone is concerned about it. Uh, we feel the effects more than others. We need to, uh, th this is one area where because we feel the effects and because of the high cost, the GNWT has actually done quite a bit over the last uh, number of years to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but of course we always have to do more. And going forward, we have to consider climate impacts in all of our decisions, in all of our uh, infrastructure and our policy decisions as well. Even service delivery uh, could have implications. 
we have to address the uh, declining caribou herds. That's an environmental issue, but that goes far beyond uh, environmental uh, concerns. That goes to food security, that goes to culture. And I know some has, work has been done, but uh, that's not something that we can ignore or uh, make half-hearted attempts to, uh, uh, to consider. And another issue which I hear a lot about in the South Slave is water. There are lots of concerns about water. Uh, the water that comes into the territory, it comes from other jurisdictions. Uh, in Alberta, you know, we're, uh, we're near the oil sands. Uh, there are major dams being constructed that can affect the level of water, and that has uh, effects, practical effects on things such as shipping, uh, as well as on uh, traditional uh, harvesting and fishing. So those are, those are some of the, the concerns that I've heard the most about, and I think we need to, uh, we need to focus on going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Ms. Marcellus. Well, we did a group of priorities. I think uh, the priorities have to be addressed, and uh, balanced development is important, and making sure that uh, the climate change issue is uh, a priority in all our decisions that we make in the future with regards to infrastructure, and uh, or any other decisions that are made is important. I also feel that uh, I want to express my, and put on my Indigenous hat, and I want to explain to the Assembly that Indigenous people are environmentalists in their own way. We've always looked after the water, the land, and everything around us, and the animals. And I think that it's extremely important that uh, indig indigenous people are part of the, uh, the whole issue of climate change. And I think that uh, also uh, that a climate change uh, uh, piece of uh, the whole development of the Polytech in Inuvik will be an incredible uh, solution for studying climate change for not only for the Northwest Territories, but for Canada and for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Monsieur, Mr. Speaker-elect. Uh, Mr. Speaker-elect, the, the climate... The cli when you're speaking about land climate change it is a it's a big issue in the north when you look at it there's a lot of changes in the environment not only the water but the land the animals all the things that are on the land and even the um to to make uh, winter roads it's getting a lot uh, difficult so when you're talking about climate change, it has to be um, one of the priorities for the next four years, and I think we can work on that all together. Um, and we've talked about it in for the last uh, four years, so I'm, I know a lot of people here that are, are, are want to work on it for the next four years. We have to also listen to the people in order to work on the climate change. We have to also include the young people and also the and also the elders who are almost like our doctors. Um, the, so we have to take all the information from the elders and the elders have to also work with the young uh, people on this climate change. They are almost like our scientists. They're scientists all within the ca uh, Canada, but they are, they are our scientists We're in the north, and we have to make, put them ahead with the climate change issue. Even in the 50 to 100 years from now, we will see the results of their work. So, so there's a lot of people there's lots of people that are southern people that want to say we can do this and do it this way but we have to learn to work together because this is we have different uh, knowledge of this issue the young people and the elders so when you're talking about climate change it is extremely important because it affects our water our land and our animals thank you 
Next on our list, we have Miss Simler. Um, as we have heard loud and clear this past um, couple weeks, uh, that the Indigenous governments do not have any trust in our government. Can you tell me why you would be the best person that should represent us in building this relationship? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Similar. First on our list, we have Mr. Lafferty. Masia, Mr. Speaker elect. Speaker elect, the Inuvik members are going to be on the IPAD. That's not good. That's on the Shisha Lotte. That's the Yachi. Okay, then we can hold along the Shisha Lotte. We'll hold the Lani Leon. Okay, then. That's it. Sometimes it's difficult to work together. Sometimes we have issues that we can resolve. And now we have a lot of new MLAs. And, and we also talk about having one voice. In order to go forward, we need to build trust amongst each other. We need to talk to each other about what's important to us in our region. And once we settle that and have a good relationship, we'll, we'll be able to go forward. So, so we need to keep an open uh, communication with each other so that everyone knows what everyone else is doing. And also, Northwest Territories, we need to communicate with the Denny leadership and the mayors of the Northwest Territories because they, are, they have the grassroots information in the region. Sometimes, uh, if we don't know this information, we're not able to resolve uh, the issues uh, uh, at our table. I believe that working together and having trust amongst each other is very important. And when I look at the past leadership, we didn't have that in place. And everyone knows here, I've said this to the eight member, 18 members here. We talked about our priorities and how we can work together. In order to do that, we all need to work together. And I'd like to thank every one of the MLAs and also the leadership that's here as well. I'd like to thank them. Ms. Cochran. Must see. Just governments and building trust. Trust is not an easy thing. People often use it and say, I've often heard, trust openly, and then if it's taken away from you, don't trust again. Slap once and don't be careful if you turn your head again. However, I will say that I've built my relationship over the last four years, built on trust. I've been very honest in all of our bilaterals. Many chiefs, many indigenous governments have called me. They have my, many have my cell phone numbers, which is something I don't give out to everyone. Um, they know it's an open door policy. I've done things <clears throat> as a minister for indigenous governments that haven't been done before. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you an example, even though my colleague is standing here as well. Salt River, never before was there a housing unit put in that community. Never before. As a minister, I said fairness to all. I was the first minister to bring housing units into Salt River. I've worked with Colville Lake, they're looking at a school. They've gotten some pushback saying, department saying we want to do it on our own. I've given them my word. We will work together. So trust is something that we have to build, we have to earn. It's not something that I'm gonna walk in and assume that, that we have. People, indigenous people have been hurt for many, many years not only in their leadership, but all of the people. So it's something that we have to be conscious with, and the biggest way to build trust, in my opinion, is to be open and to be honest. I'm not gonna promise things I cannot deliver, because if I do that once, I have lost that trust. So I'm honest to, is my strength and my weakness, and I think that most of the indigenous governments know me by now, 
and they know it, my word is my honor, and that's the most important thing that I can bring. Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. Thank you, Ms. Cocker. Next, we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. When we met with the Indigenous leaders from around the territory uh, last week, two weeks ago, I can't, it's been a world, but I can't really recall when it was. It was recently, though. There was a strong desire. Everyone who spoke had a strong desire to improve relationships with the GNWT. Uh, it was clear that everyone had been frustrated in the past, but everyone saw this as an opportunity to move forward, and we need to capitalize on that. We need to listen and understand why there is that lack of trust. Not make assumptions, actually listen. And we have to address those issues. And like I said in, in my previous speech about uh, accountability, you know, I can say I'm going to do a better job and I'm going to be more trustworthy and I'm going to um, listen more, but what about when I'm gone? So what we need to do is put some procedures in place the same way that the cabinet and uh, the regular members have uh, communications protocols. We need that, those type of things in place for Indigenous governments. Because I've heard the frustration that there will be a meeting and then there's no follow-up for months, maybe for years. Four years is the last one I heard where there was an issue that had just been unaddressed. So every time the government comes back to the table, the Indigenous government has to bring this issue back up again. And that's not acceptable. So it's, it's those kind of things that we need to put in place so that no matter who's in the office, we can maintain a level of trust. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Ms. Marcellos. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Being in that leadership since 2007, an Indigenous leader, and sitting around that table and listening to the Indigenous leaders on October the 17th uh, was uh, quite an experience sitting on the other side because uh, I've lived that. I think uh, the Indigenous people have to have a strong voice in changing the way government thinks. We are the majority of this Northwest Territories and uh, I take a very strong stand on making sure that all the claims that are outstanding are settled. I also make claim that all the uh, land uh, agreements uh, that are implemented or have not been implemented with one section or two sections that we ensure that we look at those. I think that it's extremely important that the trust uh, is reinstated by this government. Our Indigenous people are is a big file and uh, I know it thoroughly because I sat around that table since 2007. My commitment to my own people is that this will be done with honesty, with trust, with compassion, and ensuring that the people of the Northwest Territories benefit from all, because when claims are settled and uh, uh, land agreements are settled, it benefits not only the Indigenous people, but it benefits all the Northwest Territories, and then we can move forward to develop the economy. I've, I'm very compassionate about this file, and I'm sure you saw that the last couple of weeks. And uh, and I want to thank uh, thank everybody for for the for the comments that I was willing to make. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Marcellus. Next set of questions, we have Ms. Tom. Elect and con congratulations. Um, this question is from one of my uh, constituents from Nubik Boot Lake. Actually, there was another question on uh, climate change, but that was already asked. So the question is, what would the candidates do to support families losing their children to the child care system because of homelessness and the lack of support for them to care for their children? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Elect. Thank you, Ms. Tom. First on our list, we have Ms. Marcellus. This is a big file. I've had the experience of dealing with this issue. Um, uh, children that are apprehended and uh, are put in permanent care is not the way to go. 
I think that uh, uh, the social, social workers are, are work hard to try and keep the families together, uh, whether it be a, an extended family or not. Uh, many times uh, there are issues that are, are pending and I know that uh, I've dealt with this issue many times, not only territorially, but uh, cross-border in Alberta and BC and different parts of Canada because we have members from all over, the, all over Canada. Uh, one uh, situation that I had was uh, in Edmonton, uh, I had to have uh, a colleague of mine and myself sit outside a deputy minister's office for four hours uh, in order to get access because they were going to take a child away from the grandmother. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a very emotional experience. And uh, I know that uh, uh, we waited outside that deputy minister's door to make sure that we caught her when she was coming out. And uh, that's how persistent I was in the whole file. Uh, and, um, and we were successful. I think that uh, children are extremely important. And uh, the start of their lifespan and making sure that we don't uh, uh, use the wheel to reinvent any uh, residential school issues. Uh, we have to look after the child at a young age and try to keep them with the family and unite them with the family, whether it be extended family or stay with family. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellus. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Mr. Speaker, like this is a, uh, of interest to all of us. It was one of the priorities uh, uh, as we set. Child, uh, with the apprehension, false care, um, as, uh, kids being taken away uh, from their family. I feel that um, uh, this is, uh, uh, as a government, as we move forward, we need to promote more of uh, awareness of uh, what kind of uh, programs do we have, aftercare programs, or even um, um, homes that they, they need to go to. It should be, one of our first priorities should be families uh, in the communities. Uh, if, if there's not much available in the community, then uh, at least in the region. So they don't lose their language or our, our cultural way of life. We've heard over and over from our elders, from our parents from across the Northwest Territories that their kids are taken away even in my region. Some of the kids have been taken away for the last 10 to 15 years, and uh, some have lost their language as well. So we need to take that back and um, de deal with it at the, uh, as part of our priority setting. Uh, we've talked about it, and I think it's very important that we deal with this um, uh, first and foremost. Uh, to deal with uh, homelessness is a, another um, great example where uh, most vulnerable and uh, we, we, we have so many in our communities now. Even uh, here in Yalink, we have our, our own constituents that are wandering the streets. How can we uh, make our program more uh, equitable and also fairness across the board, uh, Northwest Territories, that the uh, NWT Housing Corporation programs is not meeting the needs of our people, and especially the homeless. So let's be creative, be innovative, and let's fix that issue once and for all, because. We talk about it. Now we, we should take actions to deal with, uh, with the most vulnerable people, uh, our people, in the Northwest Territories. I see the uh, speaker elect. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next we have Ms. Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. I know you've asked us to speak uh, slowly, but this is a passionate file for me, and I'm going to try to speak slowly and try to get everything I need in there. I came from a family that uh, had serious addictions and serious uh, family violence in the home. And so people think sometimes that that's a horrible story and you need to take that away. The big thing is, is we loved our parents. When our parents were not drinking, when they were not physically abusive, they were the most wonderful people in our lives. We learned to hide our secrets. I knew that if I spoke anywhere out of what was going on in my home, there was a risk of being taken away and that is not the answer. And so we kept those secrets 
and we experienced that violence for many years. We grew up with that violence and it related an anger for most of us, all kinds of issues. I spent my career, I moved into social work because I cared about people. Before I came into politics, every AGM at Health and Social Services, I was at their meetings and saying, what are you doing with these children? What are you doing with these children? Why are the numbers not going down? Why are they all indigenous? What's going on? I had my own children and I struggled through that. I didn't know because of my bringing up. I didn't know how to bathe my children. I didn't know how to feed my children. I loved my children and I needed help. Thankfully, somebody reached out to me and I was provided into a women's center and they did give me the support. They showed me how to raise and bathe my children and feed my children and take care of my children because we love our children. I'm now a grandma and I have a new baby, but she's three years old now and I love her dearly and I watch the young parents and struggling and trying to make it and I give them as much guidance and support as we can. So food, clothing, and shelter are basic needs. We should not be taking children away because of those. Those are basic needs. We need to make sure we support them. We need parenting support. We need supports for people. I want to go into longhouses, the experiences in schools when communities, indigenous communities, took care of their own. That would take way more than 21 seconds I have left. But we need to work with indigenous governments. The majority of these children are indigenous. Indigenous people have the answers. People say it's residential school if we work with them and we support them, but it's not. Indigenous people need to take ownership and work hand in hand. They are the answer. I'm running out of time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Calkin. Next we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. This is a, an issue that cuts across the government. It cuts across departments. It involves housing. It involves health and social services. It involves ECE. And it involves indigenous governments. It involves communities, community governments. And that is where the Premier's role uh, is engaged here. Uh, you know, the Premier doesn't uh, create health policy, but the Premier has to take responsibility. In the last assembly, we had a scathing report from the Office of the Auditor General about our health and social service system. And when there are situations like that, where there's something so fundamental to what we are as people, there's, there's an issue like that, that's the time when the Premier needs to step up and say, we're going to handle this. And so ultimately, this is something, even though the Premier isn't going to be uh, developing service delivery policy, the Premier has to stand up and say, this is uh, an issue that I am going to personally take uh, personally uh, look into and, and you can personally hold me accountable for it. Um, that's things that we haven't really seen in the past just because of the way our system is designed. We, we need to uh, do a better job engaging with indigenous governments and implement, implementing self-government and building capacity in communities so communities can draw down uh, the authority to, uh, to run their own programs because you know, com people in the community know their community. They know the children in their community. They know the people. The government can't do everything, the government shouldn't do everything, and we shouldn't try. We should engage the people who know how to do th this type of work. And so from the office, and the role of the Premier, that's how I would uh, uh, deal with the situation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Um, any further questions? Mr. Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Uh, good morning to my colleagues. Good morning to the candidates running for Premier. Um, I have not heard any specific strategies on addressing the issue of settling the land claims nor the self-government agreements in this House. Um, Past assemblies have reiterated the settling of land claims negotiations as a priority in order to share the lands for resource development and create partnerships with the indigenous governments of the Northwest Territories. A statement was made at the 18th Legislative Assembly stating they would create an oversight committee made up of cabinet members and regular MLAs to give direction to the negotiating team in order to settle any and all outstanding land claim 
negotiations. However, that idea did not come to fruition. I truly believe creating the Oversight Committee ensures this government is serious in settling all land claims and self-government agreements. If elected Premier, what would be your strategy to see negotiations finalized for the outstanding claims? Merci. Thank you, Mr. Bonnerge. Next, first on our list, we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When I was a member of that uh, the committee, the Joint Advisory Committee on Aboriginal Relations, I believe it was called. Uh, and, and frankly, it was more of a, a place where we would go and get briefings from the government about what was going on. It wasn't really a, a place to, to, uh, to give advice on these issues. And that sort of exemplifies the type of changes I would like to see going forward, uh, where we take advantage of all of the skill sets uh, that we have here in this assembly, and we move forward uh, making informed decisions. Uh, do I have a specific ways that, that I would advance these claims? There, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of different tables, and uh, I, I can't say that there's a specific uh, offer that I would make, but there's definitely a different approach that you can take. Right now, the approach is the GNWT and Canada make an offer to Indigenous governments, and it's, it's sort of a take it or leave it. There doesn't seem to be that back and forth. Um, and that authoritative way of dictating uh, negotiations is what needs to change. And we heard from the Indigenous governments that uh, they, they want to move forward as well. And everyone says the GNWT is what's standing in the way. So what we need is a willingness to change that. And like I've said before, nothing should be off the table. If it's a whole new way of doing business, if it's new people, then those are the things we have to do. But the, the reason I got into government, or rather into politics, is because I was tired of people talking and nothing seemingly changing. And I've come to realize over the past four years that it, it's not enough to just sort of inch along here and uh, slight, do things slightly differently. Sometimes a big change is needed, and I think to settle some of these claims that have been going on for decades, a big change is needed, and I'm willing to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Ms. Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I used the statement win-win before when we talked about going to the federal government, but we also need to carry that forward when we're dealing with our indigenous governments. It has to be a win-win situation here. It can't be top-down. It can't be the GNWT making the direction. It certainly can't be the, the federal government making the the uh, direction. So we need to first of all build that trust that we've talked about because the Indigenous governments don't have as much trust in us that we need to have. We need to bring things to the table. We need to be willing to put what we have out there. Not I'll give you a little bit and hope you don't ask for too much. Let's just be honest and put it out there and say this is what we have to offer. The biggest thing we need to do is we need to change. I keep hearing it's GNWT in Canada against the Indigenous governments. That's not what I want to hear. We need to start hearing and practicing that it's the GNWT is advocating for the Indigenous governments with, when we talk about Ottawa. We all live in this land together by fostering our relationships, by moving Indigenous governments into their own self-government. We will all become strong as a people. We say that all the time, so why don't we act on it? If we believe that, then that's how we should be walking. So I think the most important thing that we need to do is actually sit down at the table, more meetings, regular meetings, build that trust with them, put out what we have to offer on the table, and then we need to work together in advocating Canada. It can no longer be Canada directing the GNWT enforcing and Indigenous people trying to get the crumbs on the bottom. It has to start with the Indigenous governments telling us what they want. The GNWT be willing to work with them in a win-win situation and then all of us advocating to the federal government. So I want to turn it around. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Next we have Ms. Marcellus. Well, having this file since 2007 and 
we, we, every year at our annual meetings, we'd hear the same thing. The, la the claims are, are unsettled, and I'm very happy to say that it, it is one of our priorities. The things that I've been hearing from the, from the leaders of the Indigenous community is that they would like to have a negotiator that understands the claims. All the outstanding claims and the self-government agreements, and some of these self-government agreements, there's two clauses that are not being looked at. Some of them have one clause that is extremely important to their, their development. I will ensure that uh, they have a person on each claim that are familiar with the claim that is Indigenous for the government of the Northwest Territories so that we stop being obstacles to ensuring that those claims are supported, not only with our own government, but are supported to ensure that we get the best deal from the federal government for the Indigenous people of the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Masiya, Mr. Speaker-elect. Speaker-elect, this is uh, again one of the first uh, and foremost priority that we've discussed around the table. And um, all 19 of us uh, around this, uh, this building support settling the, the two outstanding claims. And um, we, as we stand here, we need to take the lead. We need to make that happen. Enough of this talk, let's put that into action. And member um, uh, is asking what are the steps to be taken. And one of the steps to be taken is uh, go outside this building, meet with the official, uh, elected officials, face to face, without any staff there. Because uh, we're supposed to be given direction to our staff to start discussion and implementation of such claim uh, to finalize. So those are discussions that we, uh, we need to have, put everything on the table, and um, uh, have a, a constant dialogue. We need to have an open communication with our Aboriginal leadership. And we've, we've heard from uh, last week from uh, NWT Indigenous government leaders that that's not the case. And uh, they hardly or rarely see, rarely see uh, uh, government leaders or, or cabinet ministers. So we, we have to improve in those areas. Working relations is, uh, is very crucial at this point in order to finalize the two claimant groups. And uh, it's time that we start listening to our indigenous leaders across the north. They've told us to, to finalize it. We need to start listening to them. And um, one of the elders' vision, obviously, is uh, uh, be united as one. All 19 of us here with our indigenous leaders. We need to have one voice going to the federal government. And they obviously will be behind us, standing behind us, supporting us. And uh, we've heard loud and clear from our elders, from our indigenous leaders, that uh, this needs to be the case. And I, for one, would like to push that forward. Masi, Mr. Speaker elect. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next we have Ms. Cochran. Didn't answer for the, this is the question on the indigenous. Is that a new question? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ahead of myself here. So, yeah. Okay, uh, next we have, I was trying to give you a second chance. <laughs> okay. Next we have uh, Mr. Jacobson. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. <laughs> I, um, I'd like today, before we get started, I'd like to welcome uh, into the house my Mayor of Tuktoyaktuk, my Deputy Mayor, uh, Mayor Mervyn Gruben, um, Deputy Mayor Erwin Elias, um, uh, former member Mr. Nakamayak, welcome to the house, and then my wife and my son Joseph. Uh, it's good to have you guys here and everybody here. Um, Mr. Speaker-elect, as you are aware, this Legislative Assembly has 11 official languages in the territory. 
some of us are uh, some strong and some not so strong, and we're losing our uh, we're losing our languages, uh, especially in the riding where I am from, uh, of uh, Siglet in Yavre Lukton and Unia um, Unia Nakton. Mr. Speaker, and even the Gutchin Nation is losing our language. And this government, uh, this 19th Legislative Assembly, what are we going to do to promote, preserve our languages and the culture of way of life? It's time to take action and let's talk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Elect. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Now we have Mr. Lafferty. Must see uh, speaker elect. Must see speaker elect. Our language and culture is very important to us. It identifies who we are. And the question that is posed to us: If we were to look at our languages. We talked about this as one of the priorities, the 19 assembly, 19 members. We need to put that forward and make it stronger. We have all departments. And if we take a look at our languages, it's, it seems like it is under education, but at the bottom list. I think it should be a different department for language, culture, and heritage. There's a lot of people that are advocating for that, and they are saying that we should make this as a priority and create its own department. Even our elders are support of this. If we were to create a different uh, department, I think it would be very important if we had that as a separate portfolio, the government, the federal government will take us more seriously. We have uh, all these official languages. And, and the more we use our language, they will listen. They, when they look at us, they look at the Department of Education and, and language don't seem to be a priority in the uh, Department of Education. I think we have our people use the language and they practice their culture. I think it's important that maybe we create our own portfolio. I think it will get stronger once we do that. As Denny people, Denny leadership will be very happy if we did that. It is their priority that we want to push forward. That's what uh, they want us to do. Masi. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next, we have Ms. Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Elect language is culture. Language is important. As a Métis woman, I realize my family down in Paddle Prairie lost their language. They don't even know which language they speak anymore. They're desperately trying to regain language. I don't want to get there. I don't want to be a, a population of people that are struggling to find out who we are to figure out what our language is. We have one of the most strongest jurisdictions in the whole of Canada in our languages, but we're slowly, quickly losing them. So it has to be a priority. I believe language is more than culture. It's about self-esteem. When you can speak your language and you feel proud in what you speak, it makes you feel proud as a person. Taking away your language is one more chip to making people feel bad about themselves and, and to taken away a society. So currently the federal government does give the governments of the Northwest Territories money for language pr preservation, revitalization. We're doing some good work. We have money going into the education system. Some schools are bringing elders into their schools, taking children on the land. We're working within our whole government departments to actually um, have access. So those 11 languages aren't available just when we have the appropriate translators in the house, which I appreciate. <laughs> but also when anyone phones to any government building that they'll be able to speak their first language and actually get services, that's critical. But the key is there's also money that we give to the indigenous governments. And I'm careful to say this because I see that it's important that we have money for schools to be able to promote it and we have money to promote the GNWT for access to services. But the, I believe in my heart that the 
strongest way of retaining and revitalizing the languages is giving it to the indigenous governments and then letting them use the money to preserve. It is their language. They know what they're doing. So I think that the best thing to do is, again, to sit down with them and talk to them and say, this is what we're using the money for. Is it the right way? Is it not? And letting them take the lead. It's no longer appropriate for the GNWT to tell them how we will preserve their language and revitalize it. It's time for them to tell us what they want to do so they can preserve their own culture and their own language. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Next we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. And uh, these, these uh, consensus government uh, leaders debates can get a little boring sometimes because often we're all on the same page and often we're all saying the same thing. We all recognize the importance of language. <clears throat> and being in this house for the last four years, I, I've seen uh, the growth of the use of language and uh, it's inspiring. And I think that we need to see that across the territory. And I agree that we need to do a better job partnering with indigenous governments, giving them uh, the lead perhaps in this. Um, we need to do better, raise our profile so that when we go to the federal government, we can get more of those funds. Because language isn't just a way to communicate, it's culture. And if, if you have a stronger connection to your culture, you have better uh, uh, mental health outcomes, uh, better education outcomes. If, we can, if we're teaching children multiple languages when they're young, you know, that does wonders for them. Uh, I know in Hay River, they, they attempted an intensive Deni, Deniati uh, program uh, to complement their intensive French program, but they couldn't get the, uh, the instructors to do you know, the 80% of the course load uh, in Deni that they, that they needed. So, we need to do more in order to do better. And uh, so I've heard good ideas around the table here and uh, going forward, I'd be happy to work with everyone and, and imp implement those. And personally, uh, I have a connection to this as well because you know, my grandpa grew, uh, spoke Cree, Chip, English, and French. You know, I spoke a little bit of French in high school, but right now I'm just, uh, just English. So I see how quickly all of that can be lost and we need to, uh, we need to take action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next, we have Ms. Marcellus. Preservation of the Aboriginal languages is extremely important. I know the territorial government uh, uh, has done uh, some, some great things because uh, we were uh, we re we recipient of some of those things that were handed down, and I know both schools in, in Fort Smith uh, have access to both languages and also the Head Start program. We teach uh, some parts of that with the, uh, the Aboriginal language. I, I think it's extremely important though that, uh, that we do more than that and my uh, idea of the Polytech Technical University slash University of the North I think that uh, there should be different sections to that, the climate change and all that thing with the erosion of the uh, shoreline in Tuck and the warming of, of, of the ocean in the Arctic. There should be a special department that is made up in Inuvik. In Yellowknife, I feel that uh, uh, because we have the hospital here that the medical center should be situated here. We should be training our nurses. We should be training our technicians. We should be training our x-ray technicians. That should be our medical center. The one in Fort Smith should be the, the place where a lot of the Aboriginal languages uh, are studied. And uh, I feel that, uh, uh, and the holistic approach to uh, medicine could be in, in that place also. Uh, the more cultural area uh, for our people of the north. And uh, so that we preserve the, the uh, languages. Uh, I have uh, lost my language because uh, my father spoke Chipperam, both my mother and my father. But they did not teach it to, to any of us because they, it was a barrier to do well in school in those days and that was uh, so I graduated without uh, learning to speak my language and uh, 
you know, it's, uh, I'm sure it's a regret today that my parents both passed away, and I, but I know it's an extremely important part. The more languages you speak, the better it is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellus. Next we have Ms. Cleveland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations on your new position. I'd also like to thank Premier Joe Hanley for joining us and thank him for his service. Um, and I've just lost my question. <laughs> there we go. Um, thank you to all of um, our colleagues who have put their names forward for Premier. Um, my question today is, given the stressors caused by the last round of collective bargaining for public servants and the territory as a whole, and given our ongoing economic challenges as Premier, what will you do to ensure a successful round of upcoming negotiations? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Ms. Cleveland. First on our list, we have Ms. Marcellus. That's a great question. You know, uh, I'm very labor friendly. I've always been very labor friendly because it's the people all through the ladder that uh, do the work to ensure that uh, the Northwest Territories moves forward. And uh, I will listen. I will ensure that uh, good decisions are made for both the government and for labor. I will always ensure that uh, we don't have so many barriers that we are able to sit across the table and mediate properly and in good faith. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Uh, Mr. Speaker, elect. Speaker, elect. This is uh, an area that we've gone through uh, in government uh, for quite some time now. Collective bargaining, as as I was uh, at our table, uh, cabinet table, it's, uh, it's very important that we look at, uh, reevaluate how we approach this, because it is our 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 community staff, community employees, contractors, and um, so those. Uh, this discussions that obviously we're going to be having, and uh, I, for one, would like to have an engagement with a, the union representatives and hear their perspectives and uh, where they're coming from and um, what is their their, their, their uh, wish list, basically. And but we have to keep in mind that uh, we have to educate them as well. That uh, our fiscal reality is is this, and uh, obviously we need to compromise somehow. And uh, as uh, Ms. Cleveland alluded to, how can we be successful uh, moving forward? And uh, if we have an open communication dialogue constantly, uh, I believe we can achieve that goal. Uh, maybe not everybody will come to an agreement, but at the end of the day, I would like to see us moving forward that benefits the communities, the region, and the whole Northwest Territories as a whole for our staff, our employees, our contractors at the community level, under the union uh, representative. So, um, I, I feel that we need to have a, the, the, the communication dialogue constantly going. And uh, there's been a breakdown in communication in the past uh, for various reasons. But at the same time, in order to achieve our goal, uh, in order to um, finalize our deal, similar to land claims, let's, 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 meet, let's co uh, constantly put on table and uh, try to work on an agreement. And we've done that in the past. And I believe we can build on the relationship that we have and make it even stronger. Must see, uh, Mr. Speaker elect. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next, we have Ms. Cochran. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. I was on the cabinet for the last collective bargaining in the union, and that was not a pleasant experience. And I certainly don't recommend that anyone that put their name forward for cabinet forget what we experienced in the last assembly. We need to learn from our mistakes. I was also, I believe, the only MLA that after the effect put on Facebook that we need to change this. So my understanding is that this went on for years and years. This is not okay. It's not okay that the union and the GNWT make this a personal battle between each other because the victims are the people that are providing the services. These are the ones that we can't forget. So I put on my Facebook, and I'm open to, to working with standing committee on it because I'm not the expert, and I, but I, we need to find a solution. So on my Facebook 
years ago, a couple of years ago, when that all went down over a year, I believe it is, it's been fast, life goes fast. We need to look at our Public Service Act. Right now, the Public Service Act says we have the right to go into negotiation and mediation. It does not have the right to go into binding arbitration. If that, when the motion was made, if it was said binding mediation, we could have stood up because that is within the act. So if binding arbitration is something that the people want, then we should be willing to put it back in, but not a compromise in saying take away the strike vote, because that's punitive. So we need to work with that. I also believe in the Public Service Act that we need to have timelines, and again, I'm open to feedback on that, because I'm not the expert on this, but it's not okay what we're doing. Let's put a timeline. People should not have to wait years and years to get through each process. There should be a timeline. Negotiation is this long maximum, and then it moves to the next step. That long maximum moves to the next step. And I don't usually like to be punitive, but maybe we need to look at consequences if the union and the JNWT do not meet those timelines and do not do that. So we need to start in good faith and move forward, but we can't forget that this is people's lives. I got calls during that time and it broke my heart of people crying and saying, if I don't have a paycheck, I can't feed my children. And that stays with me forever. This is not, should not be an adversarial process. We need to work, we need to make it better, and it cannot be lip service. We need to look at our act and figure out how we can strengthen it so we have the best interests of our employees always. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Next we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. The, the thing we need to do, I believe, is improve our relationship uh, you know, as, uh, as the elected members with the public service. We need to show respect to the public service and we need to listen to their concerns so they don't get dealt with during contract negotiations. That's the worst time to try and deal with everyday concerns. That's why I talk about things like having some sort of a feedback loop where these frontline concerns that people are talking about for years on end actually get dealt with. A, a lot of times the, the complaints are things related to, to, to mental health. You know, we, we heard talk about that in the, in the contract negotiations. Well, if, you, if you're listening to people and you're improving the situation on an ongoing basis, those don't become concerns. We need to worry, we need to do a better job with uh, the timing of these meetings. I thought that I was, I thought that I was an idiot because I would look at these, these uh, meeting schedules and see months in between them and I thought, oh, I guess that's how negotiations go. You know, it, it, that doesn't make any sense to me, but these guys must know what they're doing. No, you need to, you can't wait six months between meetings. You need to be at the table and hammer something out. You need to, and, and I know there are practical issues, but we gotta get over that. You know, we almost had a, a strike here. There were businesses around the territory that were hurting. There were people who were, you know, didn't go travel to see their families because they didn't know if they were gonna be able to afford it. These are real life issues. And the other thing we need to do is have better communications amongst ourselves uh, during negotiations because as a regular member in the last assembly, I didn't know what was going on until basically the 11th hour we got uh, a briefing, maybe two briefings during that entire time. And again, we need to be able to, or the regular members need to be able to provide feedback and, and, sh and show the public service that, you know, as the, the elected members, we are all concerned about this issue. So those are some of the changes that need to happen because uh, not only does no one want that to happen again, we can't have that happen again. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next on our questions, we have Mr. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect, uh, Speaker on uh, being acclaimed again. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to start up by recognizing someone in the gallery, uh, Mr. Tom Boyle. Um, Who's, uh, who's in my seat here for, uh, for several years. Um, many, many years in the public service, uh, housing, uh, as a minister and as a regular member. And on behalf of uh, To The Road, I want to say a big musty show for your service. Um, I want to start off just making a quick comment and uh, just to make sure that uh, my question is fairly simple, I'll give you some context. Um, uh, I've spoken uh, with a lot of um, my constituents about their interactions with the government. Uh, and one common theme I seem to hear is, oh, you know, um, 
we always seem to run into barriers, we always seem to run into red tape, there's always these obstacles. And what I mean by that is, if you're a small business, there's something going on with the BIP policy. If you're um, a struggling single mom that wants to get into housing, you have some policy that is blocking your way to get into a home. Or if you're uh, an applicant, job applicant has been has earned their way, worked really hard to get an education, and still can't get a job within our government ranks. From no action. And early on here, we have some discussions about our policy and policy restructuring. Um, so my question to the um, premier candidates is: Of these three policies I mentioned, BIP, um, affirmative action, and housing policies, what do you feel needs immediate attention? in this 19th Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Noren. First we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Like, I didn't quite catch the end of it, uh, but I think it's my comments on these policies and what needs to be changed, basically. And the member is, is correct. There's, there's a lot of red tape, and one of my biggest concerns with uh, service delivery is, is the service delivery. There seems to be a default to no. Uh, the, when there's an issue and someone needs help, the default answer is no. When it should be, how can we help? You know, how can we get to the answer? Yes, there's policies in place and we need to be accountable, so we need to follow those policies, but there are ways to get things done. And we have to remember we're in the customer service business. And, the, you know, the, from the top down, I've noticed there seems to be this notion that uh, the government isn't necessarily there to serve the people. It, it's sort of an attitude as we're doing you a favor and we need to change that mentality and it's got to happen right from the top down and, and that goes across all policies you know and, and we so we have housing policies um, sometimes people can't get into houses because there's just not enough houses you know and hey river we just don't have places to put people right now but if that so that's one barrier and that one i understand but if it's if it's something where everyone who's looking at the situation says this doesn't make sense there should be a way to rectify that situation. We shouldn't just say, nope, that's what the policy says, and then move on. And that goes for everything. And the affirm I mean, I have a minute here to talk about affirmative action and the business incentive policy, and I'm not going to be able to, to, to touch on them, basically, the way that they need to be. But it's been acknowledged that those policies need to be looked at. We need to make sure that they're serving their purpose. And for a long time, according to a lot of people, they haven't been. And... Uh, it's been clear from what I've heard in the public and from the members here that we need to, to re-examine those. And, you know, in my, if I'm the Premier, I will do what I can in that role to ensure that not just those policies are looked at, but policies across the territory have a focus on service delivery and customer service. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I'm actually running is because that, the Premier's position is the one who you know, gives the mandate uh, letters to the, the deputy ministers and to the ministers. And mandating uh, better customer service is something that the Premier can do, and, that, and that's my plan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Ms. Marcellus. I think all three, uh, three policies are extremely important. Um, the whole bit prep policy, we have to ensure that our local and our northern uh, contractors are uh, addressed because uh, we've heard many times that uh, a lot of the monies are flowing out of the NWT and we cannot let this happen if we want to build an economy that we are going to ensure that the money stays here. So uh, that is an extremely important policy. Uh, the housing uh, policy is also uh, uh, we know the shortage of housing, and we, uh, it is uh, one of our priorities that we looked at. And uh, as, uh, as Premier, I would make sure that uh, we ensure that uh, we rebuild on those policies to make sure that we address all the issues uh, the Indigenous governments have come forward with that to us about, because it's mostly the, it affects mostly the Indigenous population and the population as a whole, the low-income people. And the affirmative action policy, uh, I think uh, we have to review the way it is uh, uh, being uh, implemented. 
because uh, I've heard also many times lots of complaints about uh, the way the affirmative action policy has been implemented and uh, sometimes the implementation is not, uh, not the way it should be and uh, we have to be more open and transparent uh, and accountable of how we hire our own people, all the North. The people that lived here and uh, work here and we must address that issue very, so, uh, very carefully. Um, and uh, I would take a strong stand on any policy that is not addressing the issues of the Indigenous governments and the people of the North, all the people of the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellus. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Masia, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. Uh, the interaction with the uh, GNWT as a government and um, indigenous leaders is very crucial that, that we hear from them. And um, we heard clearly just last week, uh, NWT indigenous leaders, these three areas they've raised over and over. They want us to do something about it. In the past, obviously, this has been a, a barrier, an obstacle for community members, contractors, business, and um, it hasn't really benefited our communities. The, the bid process, obviously, uh, is a challenge right now. Uh, we, we hear from our community members, a lot of contracts are, are being awarded outside NWT. No benefits to the communities. Uh, that needs to be a put a stop to it. Affirmative action, we've had 32%, now it's 29%. Right? It's going down. Our GNWT affirmative action it's not working for our people, for our staff. So it, it is a concern to me. And housing corporation, that alone, we can speak all day in this house. Um, we need to be proactive, Mr. Speaker-elect. We always be, seem to be reacting to certain things that are com coming up. Let's be proactive. This makes, uh, the, the policies are there as guidance for our senior staff to start with the communities. We stand here as premier, uh, the cabinet ministers, supposed to take the lead to get direction to our staff. I don't see that happening. And um, I, for one, would like to push that forward and make it happen that they need to lead this Northwest Territories. And these three critical areas need some uh, revamp of the policies. Policies can be amended. It's not legislated. So, Mr. Mr. Speaker, let, let's move forward on the making positive changes in these areas so it benefits our communities, our business people, and uh, the, the Northwest Territories as a whole. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Let. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next, we have Ms. Coffin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let. My first instinct was to say food, clothing, and shelter. Housing is important. If you don't have your business is failing, how are you going to pay your rent? If you don't have a job, how are you going to pay your rent? But in honesty, Mr. Speaker-elect, that is not, neither of those are the most important in my opinion. They're all huge priorities. The most important people thing is give the power back to the people. Let the people, it's not for the government to determine. I had over 20 years experience working with homeless people. And when I took over housing, I did not stand here and say I had all the answers because I was old enough and smart enough to know that I didn't have all the answers, but the people did. So the first thing I did with the housing portfolio is I sent a survey across to every residence in the NWT. And I asked the people, and from the people's voice, we divided that up into short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. And then every time I stood in this session in this house, I was able to say, we did this, we did that, we did this, we did that. But it wasn't my work. It was the people's direction. And you know what? I never got slaughtered in the house because I listened to the people. And all the regular MLAs couldn't fight that because they knew it was the people's voice. Then I got education and income support. And it was a huge file and not enough time and a lot of things coming at once. But I wanted to get to income support. I never got enough done. But the first thing I did with income support, for the first time in history, I gathered all the NGOs I could together and 
the clientele on income support together, nothing about us without us. And we did the same process. I said, you can give me a basket full of problems, but then I have a basket full of problems, or you can give me the solutions. And we spent a day, it was so powerful, Mr. Speaker-elect, they had flip charts all over the room, and they wrote solutions that were incredible. And we did the same thing. We did short-term, mid-term, and long-term. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, I never had enough time in the last assembly, so we only got a few things ticked off of the, the short-term goals. By my direction, if, if elected to be your premier, to every single cabinet minister is you work, you engage, you don't just consult, you do not know it all. You engage the stakeholders applicable to your files. You are here to serve the people. Serving the people does not mean telling the people that you are the boss, you know all. Serving the people means asking the people and listening to them and making your decisions based off the direction of the people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Calkin. Colleagues, members of the public, I'd like to take this time to recognize our newly re-elected Member of Parliament for the Northwest Territories, Mr. Michael McLeod. I'd also like to recognize former Premier Joe Hanley and former MLA Kieran Tester. At this time, we'll take a 15-minute break. Thank you.
will now call the Territorial Leadership Committee back to order. Order. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, next we had on our list uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker-elect, and congratulations on becoming the Speaker tomorrow. Mr. <coughs> Speaker-elect, it is my understanding that Date Show has taken a different approach now with their negotiations. They want to focus on taking the responsibility of education, housing, and potentially language to start with. This is a unique approach which I support. As the Premier moving forward, how are you going to be able to work with the Date Show leadership on this new direction? Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. First on the list, we have Ms. Calkin. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is actually really exciting news. I'm really glad to hear this, actually. It's uh, one of my passions. When I actually took over as the Minister of Municipal and Community Affairs, um, I have to say it was a pretty easy file because the first thing I said to them is, community development, are we giving the say to the community and the Aboriginal organizations, and Mac has said we're there. So that was great. That's all about giving power to the people. That's what I've said. I actually also was working with a chief who, in one of the communities, and I won't say which, who unfortunately lost his seat. And at that time, we were talking about bringing down housing. I was the, Mac, or the housing minister at that time. The election changed, and so we need to rebuild that relationship. So I'm really excited that governments are looking at this. My opinion, to work with them, it's not about telling them, this is how we do it. This is our system. We need to give them the money for our system. This is our system. This is how we spend our money. Community development is really about listening to them and providing support. So as the GNWT, our role isn't to say, we know best, and we will tell you how to do it, but it's to say, we are supporting you. What do you want from us? And we are there to support you in actualizing your own community self-government because self-determination is the answer. So thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect, <coughs> and thank you for the member for bringing it forward. This is probably the most exciting news, well, potentially the second most exciting news, hopefully, of the day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Next we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Um, this is a, a unique case, obviously. It, it's uh, one of the claims that has been ongoing for many, many years. And I believe, from my understanding, the reason that um, HO is at this point is because there has been such a roadblock to getting a deal uh, regarding lands and resources, which is generally how things are done. It's, it's you get the land and the resource base, and then you, uh, you start doing the, the, the other things, the service delivery. And so instead of just accepting the fact that there's this problem with land and resources and negotiations are broken down, can we look at moving that forward? And uh, I think that that's the first thing I would do, is figure out what those issues are. But like I said, um, nothing's off the table. And we need to keep an open-minded approach and, and move forward uh, for the benefit of the people. What is going to benefit the people on the ground, the people receiving these services the most? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Ms. Marcellos. Well, being at the main table with uh, Grand Chief Norwegian was, a, was a, an inspiration. She had, uh, she always, she's a great thinker. <clears throat> and if there's been a change of uh, direction in the land claim, it was always uh, the position from uh, uh, Salt River that we supported the debt show claim. And uh, if it takes a different direction, uh, so the support will always be there. I think that uh, calling her and asking her uh, for clarification of the direction that they are taking is important and I'm willing to do that. And um, I think that uh, the Detcho claim has got to be settled so that uh, the region uh, prospers uh, with that whole region and it's all good for not only for 
uh, the region, but for the whole Northwest Territories, and I support the, uh, the completion of the Adecho claim. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. I see, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. Speaker-elect, uh, I believe we're all on the same page with this file. Um, obviously, we have to respect um, their approach if it's a di different direction, as we've heard uh, just last week from the Grand Chief. We have to be open-minded. As the GNWT going forward with uh, the two outstanding land claims and South government negotiation, if there's a, a will to negotiate education, housing, and potentially language, let's be there with them. Let's support them. And if they need space from us, then let's, let's respect that as well. They want to get their claims settled, and we feel the same way too. And the, both parties, with, along with the federal government, I, I believe we can go a long way. But we have to be open-minded and uh, respect their, their direction and their approach as well. And uh, Mr. Speaker-elect, end of the day, we're empowering the communities to have the full authority to deliver these core programs, education, housing, and language. Others can follow uh, eventually, but uh, they want to settle on those three terms, and I fully support that as well going forward, that uh, any, any opportunity that comes to our, our table, uh, if it's going to be achieved within the next four years, by all means, let's, let's pursue it and let's get it done. Merci, uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. I'd like to take this time to recognize Mr. Henry Zhu, former minister, former Emily. Thank you. Next on our list, we have Ms. Wazunik. Thank you, Speaker Elect, and congratulations again. For the last three weeks or so, we've all, I believe every one of us has at some point said how important consensus is, the value of it, the value of making decisions together as a group where we do that by listening to every voice as equals. So the role of Premier sets itself aside and sets itself apart from that. My question is actually quite simple, but sometimes those are the most difficult. I would like to know why it is that you are seeking this office. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wazunik. First we have Mr. Lafferty. I see uh, Mr. Speaker-elect. <coughs> Speaker-elect, uh, Consensus Dar government said the consensus dial government is the one that works together. Um, well, the reason I'm running for premier is because I want to see some changes. The previous government had difficulty working together, but now that we have a new government, we all want to work together not only us as a government here, but all the Northern um, Aboriginal government want to work together. But we also have to work with the federal government at the same time. And we just had um, an election uh, for federal government, which is uh, Michael McLeod. I'm very happy that he's um, re-elected. I know that he is there to support the people of the North. So that is one of the reasons we run for office, because we want to see some changes. The way the people live in the North, the people the, in the North have given us what they want us to do. We, want, it, it, we know that there's policies that we don't really like. There's lots of people that are in poverty that we have to help and listen and take care of them. So. We have to have good communication. That's the only way to work together. We also have to listen to our elders from the past. We have to listen to each other and speak as one voice. Here, we are sitting here as a government. We have to hold each other and support one another. Well, one of the most important thing is we have to listen to the northern people and support whatever it is that they want to be done in their either government or their their regions so we have to support them for the next four years 
That is one of the reasons I have put my my name forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. Mr. Lafferty, next we have Ms. Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. The question that I'm seeking this office was a question I had to ask myself many times. In fact, it was a question I asked myself four years ago when I ran for, for to be an MLA. Um, for most of my life, I've, I've heard the saying, you can make changes from the outside in. You can make changes from the inside out. I tried that. I spent over 20 years working with low-income people saying, help us, help us, help us, and no one <coughs> helped us. For 20 years, over 20 years, we never got an increase, $30,000 a year core funding to support homeless women. I spoke on that before. And I talked to people that worked in the bureaucracy, people that worked for the government, and I heard their frustrations, and I thought, well, even from the inside out, you're struggling to make change because often they were said, this is your job description. If you don't like it, you can leave. And then one day it kind of an epitome came across and I thought, why do we always talk the inside out and the outside in? Why don't we talk about being the top? So at that time I decided to put my name forward and it wasn't about power and control. In all honesty, Mr. Speaker elect, this is not an easy job. I came from the NGO world where people loved me. The only people that fought against me were the government. And then I came into a place where half the people love me and half the people that most of them don't even know me hate me with such passion. But I believe the reason that I'm here is because we can do better. I came in here hearing about consensus government and hearing it was based on an Aboriginal policy, place of doing business where each person has a say and each person is valued for their input, and I haven't seen that. So one of the skills I do bring, so it's different. Being a premier is totally different than being a minister or a regular MLA. Job as an MLA is to fight for your people, to keep us accountable. The job as a minister is to make sure your departments work hard and get the changes done. The job of a premier, Mr. Speaker-elect, is to bring together the members of the assembly. We won't always agree. But Mr. Speaker-elect, my experience, my background, and my heart, my heart is why I'm here, and I will work hard, as hard as I can, all of us together, to make sure that every member's voice is heard and they have a say, and that the people, more importantly, have a say. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. Next we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. I'm running for this role because I see that there are things we can do to improve our system of government and improve the way the government functions and serves the people of the territory. Consensus government is still very young. It's a very young form of government, and there is room for improvement. Uh, things have, have changed. I saw some improvements in the last four years, but there's, there's much more uh, room for improvement, and. We need to start doing those things, and we need to understand that we need to improve. It needs to be ongoing. It's not something where you, you get in the office and you make changes the first week, and that's it. No, we have to have a culture where we are always looking at how we govern and always looking to make improvements. I want to change the expectations in consensus government. Uh, I want someone to take accountability. As I stated, when it's, it's everyone, it's all members' uh, responsibility to hold ministers and the premier accountable. But when it's everyone's responsibility, it seems like it's no one's responsibility. And we need a premier who's going to say, I'm going to take that responsibility. The buck is going to stop here. And I want that expectation to continue forward into future assemblies. Uh, there's the customer service aspect that I spoke about earlier. Uh, the government needs to be re reoriented so that it has a focus on service delivery and uh, not defaulting to no. It has to, the default answer has to be, OK, maybe this doesn't work, but we'll see how we can help you. How can we get to yes? Uh, I've seen government overreach, the government getting into areas where maybe they shouldn't be. The government competing with the private sector in, in certain ways. Not, not in always. I mean, there's some, there's some uh, enterprises that they have to get into, but there's a, a notion that the government is the authority and it's somehow superior to, uh, you know, to, to private businesses, to indigenous governments, and that mentality needs to change as well. Uh, the economy needs to be addressed uh, in the South Slave, I, I was standing up in this house for four years. My very first speech was about the economy in the South Slave. And I, I rarely see mention of that anywhere in, in the media. Um, and other than myself in this house, rarely from, my, from anyone else. Well, I won't say that. I won't uh, 
I won't say that about my uh, colleague from the Nahende, but we need to have a focus on that because that's been lacking as well. The other thing I want to do in this role is help advance some of these things that should have been done 50, 60, 70 years ago to help make the territory self-sufficient. It's time to, you know, we always say, oh, I wish this uh, Mackenzie Valley Highway was built 50 years ago, but we can't do it now. Well, if we don't do it now, they're going to be saying the same thing in 50 years, so we have to do that as well. And the main thing I wanted to do was give the power back to the people, Mr. Speaker, and that's through things like ensuring everyone has access to the amazing wealth of this territory and ensuring everyone has quality education. Thank you for the, uh, the extra couple seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next, we have Ms. Marcellos. Thank you. I feel I have the personal qualities of a good leader. I'm compassionate, I'm strong, and I feel that I'm a thinker. I have a balance of, that I bring to the table of, in, of knowing the issues of the Indigenous governments and bringing solutions. I also know that the economy is a big part of the whole picture. And I bring to you an acrement of 40 years or more in the private sector. I bring a balance, a balance that is required <coughs> at this time in our history of the government of the Northwest Territories. I bring new ideas. I bring hope. I bring togetherness. I look around this table and I see 18 other MLAs who want the same thing. And I think that uh, as a group, with our partnerships of all levels of government, municipal, our government, the federal government, and the private sector, we can do it together. We must have hope that the future of the Northwest Territories and the future generations of all people of the Northwest Territories will benefit from our decisions because our decisions made around this table benefits everyone and affects everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next on our list, we have Ms. Chinna. My question is uh, in regards to mental health and addiction. Uh, right now, the Northwest Territories does not have a facility for our clients to be um, uh, attending these facilities in the Northwest Territories. They have to go south and I'm talking about the uh, mental health patients or the incarceration uh, inmates, that once they um, are in these facilities, they have the proper diagnosis south, but when they come back north and they return back to their communities, there's no support for them to integrate them back into a regular lifestyle. And I think that it's a ongoing process. They either end up back in their addiction situation or else they're repeat offenders. As a premier and as a government, what will you do to support our people returning back to our home communities to deal with their mental health and their addiction? Thank you, Mr. Speaker elect. Thank you, Ms. Chinna. First on our list, we have Ms. Marcellus. Mental health and addiction is, a, is a, a, an issue that affects each and every family, no matter what gender, what, what uh, uh, anyone in every family in the Northwest Territories is affected by some form of addiction. And it's a very important issue. Um, the mental health issue is uh, usually a trauma that happened uh, with uh, the residential school system. It could have been with uh, trauma in early life. Uh, there's so many uh, aspects to this whole question. And uh, as an advocate for, uh, for it, I want to tell you that uh, in my former role, that we had uh, several uh, on-the-land programs uh, of six-week duration uh, that was uh, 
We had a full team from Powell Makers that did it, and it was included the whole community, uh, no matter from which background you came from. And, uh, and uh, the one thing that always said, we, we said was the six weeks, and then we also did the, uh, developed uh, the whole programs with the meetings, and then after that is the aftercare. And, uh, you know, families were all involved in this whole situation, and I'm very, very favorable to make sure that uh, the mental health and addictions issues is one of the pri priorities that I ran on in my mandate at the local level. It's one of my mandates in, at this level, and I'm sure it's the mandate of everyone around this room. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Mr. Speaker-elect, Speaker, let the, obviously that the mental health is, uh, is very complex uh, when, when we're dealing with the community members. Um, we talk about uh, uh, lack of facilities in the Northwest Territories, we have to ship them out down south and um, no support upon their return. And um, one of the areas uh, we need to increase um, we talked about around table, even we hear from uh, indigenous leaders uh, across the Northwest Territories is uh, having our culturally respected community base on the land program. Where uh, it would, it would uh, target uh, mental health and addiction, utilizing our elders. Our elders are like teachers, they're like doctors in the community and community members. Those individuals are, are highly qualified in our view from the community's perspective. And we need to utilize their services. They're not going anywhere. They'll be in the community. They're there to offer support and help. And after care program, we seem to be lacking. Every time we have people shipped down south, there's not much support when, upon their return. Let's, uh, let's focus on uh, programs that they're offering down south, wherever they happen to be part of their addiction or mental health. And now, uh, what's been offered over there? Could we expand even further in the Northwest Territories? And on the land program is a, is a must. Um, we have uh, so many talented people in the community that we need to utilize their services. And this is one area that uh, our community can get involved. It takes a whole community to have a uh, raise, we, we always heard that it takes a whole community to raise a child for beautiful beautification of our community and the wellness of our community. So we have to start from the community grassroots level, and that's where I want to push forward on this particular important piece of work on mental health and addiction. Mr. Speaker elect. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next we have Ms. Calkin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mental health and addictions is huge uh, across the Northwest Territories. And I think we have to start within Cabinet. So we, last assembly, and I'm thinking it was a good idea, we need to move forward with it, we had what is called a social issues committee. Um, part of the members was justice, health, housing, and, and uh, I would like to see human resources part of that as well. Um, so we need to sit down as members because we always talked about programs, and so we talked about debate about programs, but we never started with developing a philosophy of care. So I think that's what we need to do first as ministers. We need to develop within the social programs what is our philosophy around caring for people. That's the start. And then I think when we need to move, many years ago when I was, um, I'd like to be able to promise treatment centers in every community. That's not going to happen. We don't have the resources. We're all aware of that. And it w even if we had the resources, it would take many years. But way back in the day when I was in university, there was a community called Alkali Lake. Um, and it was a dry community, and so I have to say that was some of it. But the chief in the community put their resources into their people. So when people went out for treatment, they worked with the whole family, they developed it <coughs> with their family, they went in and they painted their houses, they took care of them. So when the people came back from the addictions, they had a new life, it wasn't the same environment that they had gone from. It was bright and fresh and they had worked with their family. Sadly, I followed it for years, and sadly, the community had a change in leadership, and uh, 
They opened up the community. It was no longer dry. The chief didn't believe in the philosophy. The supports weren't there. We can't do that. What I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, like we can't do this alone. We need the communities to help us with this. And we need everyone. It does take a community to raise a child. It takes a community to have a healthy community. We need to work together in addressing this after <coughs> The supports when they come home are critical. And if we can't get the community there, the least we can do, the very least, is to at least make sure they have a home when they come back. It's not okay. If we send them out and we haven't changed things when they come back, we're setting them up to fail. And that is not the answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Elect. Thank you, Ms. Cocker. Next we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Uh, you know, when the Assembly uh, puts together its list of priorities, this may be on there, this may not be on there. Regardless, this is something that uh, the government should be doing. Uh, it's it's the most basic, one of the most basic uh, services the government uh, should provide is ensuring that the people have the, a basic level of health. Uh, and, and when you're suffering from mental health or addictions, you don't have that basic uh, level of health. This, is a, this issue is cyclical. It will keep repeating itself unless uh, uh, we put an end to it. And it has ripple effects across the community and across generations. And we will, the government often um, focuses a lot on symptoms. We need to start focusing on causes. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, investing. Uh, well, we can, if we invest in people, we can save money uh, later on. If you want to look at it from a strictly financial point of view, this uh, issue, engages multiple departments, housing, uh, ECE, through income assistance, health and social services, justice sometimes. And so what we need, and what I, what I proposed, is, a, uh, is like a, a policy unit that is responsive to cabinet and uh, um, accountable to cabinet that can put together a broad approach to fixing this. Right now we have health with solutions, uh, housing does some things, but we need to have a program, a policy, a way of doing things that ignores the fact that we have all these different government departments. We need to say, how do we fix the problem? Not how can this department fix the problem? What can this department do to fix the problem? What can this department do? And then we need to implement that, and we need to make sure that it's actually working. And if it's not, then we change it. And those are the kind of changes I'd like to make as Premier, uh, so that there is more accountability, and it's not, we don't just stand up in this house and say, yes, this is a problem. Obviously, it's a problem. We all know what a dire problem it is. But how are we going to change it? We, you know, we say we, we're concerned about it, but what changes are you going to make to how we do business? Because everyone's been concerned about it for a long time. So we need to change the way we do business. And like we've all been saying now for days, partnerships. Partnerships with uh, Indigenous governments, partnerships with communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next on our list, we have Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would also like to thank the four candidates running for Premier. We all just came off of a long fought election and to uh, try now to lead this house of politicians takes courage. Um, I also think this competition, no matter who wins today, will come out better because of it. It means you all have to listen, you all have to compete with each other. Um, the Premier, more than any of us, makes a sacrifice and that when they become Premier, they must put aside their own personal priorities, the, sometimes the priorities of their constituencies, sometimes their own political priorities, as we as 19 members will table our priorities that we have set for the next four years. So my question to you is simple, is if you become Premier, are you willing to put aside your own personal priorities and at times the priorities of your constituents in order to be Premier? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. First on our list, we have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, and it, putting aside your own personal priorities, is, it goes without saying, that is the role. And if, if you don't do that, you have no credibility, you have no legitimacy, and the Assembly should rightly remove you from that office if it's clear that uh, you are putting your personal priorities above those of the Assembly. Uh, the second part of the question about uh, your constituency's constituents' priorities is, is another thing altogether. Uh, regardless of who's Premier, they're still the only MLA for their constituency. And I would expect nothing, I would expect them to fight just as hard as they would if they were a regular member for their constituency. But there has to be that divide. You can't, uh, you, have to, you have to take a holistic view, but your constituents can't be left without a representative. So it, it is a balancing act. And I, I can see uh, 
uh, our concerns with that. Uh, you know, unless we want to elect the premier at large, we want something like the United States, where you're elected by everyone. We're gonna, we have that system, and that's the same system in Canada. But it's up to, like I said, the, the premier needs to be accountable. The buck has to stop somewhere. And failing that, the assembly has to keep them accountable. And I would fully expect that if a premier is putting their personal preferences above uh, th their role and their duties as premier, that the assembly would remove them as they should. And I would support that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Next we have Ms. Marcellos. I think being an objective person and making decisions on our priorities that we set as a group is extremely important. Non-biased opinions are extremely important. Ethical values and honesty to what the, all of us have decided are the priorities is of utmost importance. And I will ensure that those are kept. And uh, any decision that I make will be good for all of the Northwest Territories. I will not put an issue forward on a personal basis at any time. I think that uh, we still have to serve our constituents. I will do that also in an objective manner to ensure that everybody in the Northwest Territories is served equally. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Next we have Mr. Lafferty. Masia, Mr. Speaker-elect. Uh, Speaker-elect, this is a, a good question to um, not only the Premier, but the Cabinet and uh, uh, the government leaders. And putting aside personal uh, priority, uh, I believe it's a must. And um, obviously there is code of conduct we have to follow as well within the Legislative Assembly. Put aside priorities of constituents, it is a balancing act. Uh, we were elected as an MLA, and will continue to serve as an MLA for the next four years. But there are ways of uh, working around that, where if you become a premier, you have a different role. And I stated in the past where when you become a, a cabinet minister, you, you put your hat, uh, MLA hat on the side, and you focus on uh, uh, implementing your department's uh, goals and objectives. But at the same time, you have your staff that can deal with uh, constituency issues. But, but you cannot let go of that. It's always going to be there. You need to work with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it is a balancing act. And, um, but the, like I said, there, there is uh, ways of working around it as a, as a premier. And um, we've done that in the past. And I've had a cabinet and also the speaker's role. Uh, speaker obviously didn't have uh, questions in the house, but there's other, other areas that uh, had opportunity to access, uh, obviously, the, the premier and cabinet. So, those are just some of the areas that uh, we can uh, improve on as a working relations. So, Mr. P uh, Speaker elect, um, you know, constituency, uh, we are still there, MLA will continue to do so, but there's ways uh, working around it. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Next, we have Ms. Cochran. Thank you, Mr. S Speaker elect. <clears throat> So when I did my speech a couple of days ago, feels like weeks ago, <laughs> um, I talked about you know not deciding which priority was the key because we'd all take part in that. But I also talked about which were priorities to me, and that was about showing who I was, showing that my heart, showing where my concerns are. But I recognize that we are developing our priorities. We all had input in that. I also had a chance to speak in that process, and we decided. Each of us, we will finish up the defining of the priorities, and that's the Premier's job is to move those forward. However, recognizing that departments and, and work still goes on above and beyond our priorities, I think that was a stress for many members. If it wasn't on the list, it's not going to get done. So opening up my heart and showing who I was kind of showed the direction that I would be going as a person, take it or not, that's who I am. The priorities of constituents, they have to come first. 
So they have to come first, but that's why we have constituents' assistance. And it's tough being a premier. It's tough being a cabinet minister. Your time is very limited, and you're pulled in all directions. So the priorities of my constituents should be, as premier, your job is to take the responsibility for all residents. But if a constituent comes to me and says, I can't get in my housing, income support has cut me off, I'm struggling as a small business, how is that not the needs of all residents? Because my gut is telling me if one person says it, there's many people in many communities saying it as well. One thing I can promise, though, in my ride in the Range Lake, if I'm a premier, you will not see a huge sky rise in my riding. You will not see a major infrastructure project in my riding unless all members say it is the best thing for the Northwest Territories. So dealing with constituents' issues, they should be able to relate to issues throughout. Doing special privileges because I want your votes, that will not happen. I would rather be defeated and knowing I can hold my head high and say I was ethical as I've done throughout the last four years and that will be how I guide myself. I've shown that in the last four years, and I would rather lose an election by being ethical than winning an election, and because I've done some kind of special favors for people in my riding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. Thank you, Ms. Calkin. Colleagues, it appears that there are no further questions for the Premier candidates. Before we vote, I want to thank all candidates who agreed to put their names forward for Premier. This was a long morning, but you have given us all confidence that whoever is chosen to be our Premier will be up with the job. I think this experience indicates that the process we use to select a Premier is, in, is an open and transparent one. Members are now asked to proceed to the clerk's table where they will receive their ballot. If members could then please proceed to the voting booths to mark their ballot and then place, place it in the ballot box located in front of the clerk's table. Members, when you come to get your ballots at the table, please come to the clerk on the side of the chamber where you are seated. In other words, members, members on my right should go get their ballots from the clerk on my right and vice versa. Please proceed.
there being no one else wishing to vote, I will now proceed to vote myself. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare the voting process closed. The ballot box will be now taken to the clerk's office where the ballots will be counted. The bells will be rung for five minutes to bring the members back in once the results are determined. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is my duty to announce that there is a need for a second ballot for the position of Premier. The nomination, nominees for the second ballot are in alphabetical order. Ms. Cochran, Mr. Lafferty, and Mr. Simpson. Before we proceed to the vote, are there any nominees wishing to withdraw at this time? There being no such withdrawals, the ballots are available as before. Please proceed to vote. Please proceed. Are there any more members wishing to vote who have not voted yet? There being no one else wishing to vote, I will now proceed to vote myself. <clears throat> I declare the voting process closed. The ballot box will now be taken to the clerk's office where the ballots will be counted. The bells will be rung for five minutes to bring the members back in once the results are determined. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. It is my duty to announce that there is a need for a third ballot for the position of Premier. The nominees for the third ballot are Ms. Cochran and Mr. Lafferty. If members could please proceed to the clerk's table, the ballots are available before you. Are there any more members wishing to vote who have not voted yet? There be no one else wishing to vote, I will now proceed to vote myself. I declare the voting process closed. The ballot box will now be taken to the clerk's office where the ballots will be counted. The bells will be rung for five minutes to bring the members back in once the results are determined. Thank you.
at the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I declare that you have elected Miss Cochran as your premier elect. Congratulations, the appointment will be confirmed tomorrow by motion in the House. I would now like to give Ms. Cochran an opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Speaker-elect. I never actually made a written speech for today, so I'm going to speak from the heart. Um, I want to begin by thanking all of the people, all of the people of the Northwest Territories for having faith in me. I thank my constituents for allowing me to get back in. I thank all of the MLAs for their votes, not only for me, but for all members. And I thank the members who stood forward and put their name. I know personally it was very challenging and not easy. <coughs> my commitment to all of you, though, is that I've heard it, and we need to work better together. So for each member that stands here, my commitment is to always have an open door to put my heart in the people and to hear your words because together we make a stronger government and working together with our indigenous and community organizations in the NGO world, we will make this next four years the most progressive government in the Northwest Territories. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. I will now adjourn our proceedings for this morning. For lunch, we will reconvene at 1 p.m. this afternoon for the election of the Executive Council. Thank you.